I'm, I'm saying something now. Does this sound like it's going to work on your, your screen? Okay. Sound good? Okay. Well, we still have a little, like a half a minute or something like that. It's better to start a little bit late than early because some of the people plug in late. While we're waiting to go on, if any of you has a cell phone, please set it now so that it doesn't ring. I'll set mine too. Make sure I don't wake myself up or something. Okay. Jamie, I'm ready when you are. Okay. Well, welcome to everyone. Welcome to Hugh Ross's Paradox class. Hugh Ross is not here today. I think he will be here next week. But in lieu of Hugh Ross being here, I'm going to be talking to you about how we should approach evolution. So before I do that, I'm going to hand this time to the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for letting us be here together. Please give us wisdom, the desire to, to know your truth, and to be able to apply it to bring people to Christ. We ask all of these things in your name, Lord. Amen. So evolution, the theory of evolution is so ubiquitous now that many of us ask the question, how is it growing? Is it growing? And what are the effects of it growing? And how we approach evolution is, is a question that we should be asking as Christians because there are a lot of different ways of doing it. Some of them are harsher than others. And what I'm trying to do is, I'm going to go through some of the history. How did we get to where we are? And what does that history do to the, how does it inform what we need to be doing in the future and what we need to be doing now? So let's, let's look at exactly where we are in our culture with the theory of evolution. And before we go too much further, let me give you a definition of what I'm saying when I talk about the theory of evolution. So the theory of evolution is, in some respects, the theory of common descent. That is, that all living things that are alive today trace their ancestry back to one or more last universal common ancestors, some microbe 3.8 billion years ago. That's the, the theory of evolution that I'm talking about today. There are different variants of it. There's Darwinism, there's Neo-Darwinism, there's uh, extended evolutionary synthesis, there's all sorts of interesting versions of it. Those don't really matter right now. The point is that we're talking about the last universal common ancestor version of evolution. So the, the question was posed in an American poll that has been taken since 1983, and the last results that I have on this are to 2019. Do you believe that evolution was God-guided? And between that, in that 35-year period, between a third and 38% of the people who were asked that question in the United States said that evolution was God-guided, that evolution is true, and that God was the one that was performing the activities that brought us to what we see today. The second group was, the question was, did God create humans in their present form? Now this is very interesting because the results consistently came back between 40 and 44 percent, which means 40 to 44 percent of the Americans polled actually believe that God created humans in their present form. And that's very interesting because it sometimes doesn't seem that way, that, that Americans don't believe that, but as it turns out, they actually do. Now, that means 60 percent don't, but 40% is still a huge number. So we see the third number, which is the evolution without God. That is the atheistic evolution. This particular form of evolution or this um, assembly of believing in evolution and believing that there's no God really is the point of dispute between Christians and the, what, or what we call atheist evolutionists. And What's interesting about this is how much it has risen in the past years. So if you look at the chart here, it shows that from 1999 through 2019, the number of people who believe that 
evolution occurred without God rose from 9% of the population to 22% of the population. It more than doubled. There are other polls that are examining the same question. And I didn't have time to assemble all of them, and I'm not sure I even got all of them. But there still seems to be a rise continuing up in people who believe that evolution is true, and that evolution is true without God's intervention. So now the question is, what happens as a result of that? Well, one of the things that's occurring is that um, evolution theory has come to dominate biology. Now, the reason for it starting to sway up in the, the popular culture is different from the reason it's growing or grew in the professionals among the scientists. So what are the differences and does it really matter? Well, first of all, let's, let's look at exactly what it was that caused evolution, particularly Darwinian evolution, to become so popular among the scientists. And in order for us to really understand that, we have to realize what was the history surrounding Darwin at the time before and after him that affected how what he said was accepted. So let's look at the 100 years before leading up to Darwin. Now there are dozens of world-changing discoveries. There may have been hundreds. If you go and you check something like Wikipedia, you'll probably see 75 or 80, something like that, rather significant discoveries in that period of time. But if you look at the, the history of science, there are many, many more than that. And what I've done is I've put five here that in the 100 years before Darwin to give you an idea of what was going on in the minds of the people who are studying science at the time that, are, that were astonishing. So let's look in, in 1763, Thomas Bayes develops this prob probability theorem. Now, many people who aren't in game theory or mathematics or doing some kind of probability estimations don't even know what Bayes' theorem is. But Bayes' theorem is used all the time. So if you were to go to Las Vegas, for example, and you were to play some of the games that are that are gambled in, in Las Vegas, Bayes' theorem would be used to, to determine some of the odds. Bayes' theorem is used in probability estimates of all sorts of events that occur in the universe. And so Bayes' theorem became one of the things that um, a mathematical equation that as it went through time became more and more important. And at the time it, it was brought forth, it was astonishing. It really was astonishing, just the formula itself. And the thought that you could have a probabilistic prediction that had mathematical precision. Never had done before that. Never had been done before that. In 1800, Alessandro Volta invents the electric battery. Now we take electric batteries for granted, and we think to ourselves, okay, they're, that, they're no big deal. You know, everybody has batteries, so, so what? Well, I would be willing to bet that if you walked around and just asked, say, 100 people, tell me, how does a battery work? Most of them would not know how a battery works, even though when they're in high school or junior high school, they might have even built a battery. But they don't remember it. They don't, they don't recognize it. So, so what does that matter? Well, back in, seven, in 1800, that was a big deal. I mean, nobody even heard of a battery before. No one realized that they could create an electrical potential from something that was stored in chemicals. That was stunning. That was a, an enormous revelation. So Alessandro Volta invents the electric battery. And what he does is he shows that you can capture an electrical potential in a chemistry, in a chemical system, and then release it at will. And so when we look at something like, well, you plug something into the wall and they say, all right, that's a 110 volts or 220 volts or whatever it is, that voltage system is named after Alessandro Volta. And people don't realize that before Volta's time, that, was, that wasn't even imaginable. So here are two things. We have one that's entirely conceptual, and now you move into something that's entirely physical. In 1827, George Ohm develops the electrical resistance law. 
anytime you create an electrical circuit, there's resistance in the circuit. In other words, the voltage wants to go through it, but there's always resistance in the circuit. How do you characterize how much resistance there is? In other words, what's going to make that voltage go down or the amperage go down? Well, there weren't too many people even thinking about electrical circuits in 1827. Now, Alessandro Volta and some of his colleagues were thinking about that because they were designing circuits. But no one had characterized what it would take to understand those circuits like George Ohm. As a matter of fact, if you were to try and, if you opened up a, um, a diagram of any of the electronics that you are familiar with, you just look that up, you're going to see resistors in there. And each one of those resistors has a rating. And those ratings are rated in ohms, OHMS, named after him. And those, those ratings are telling you how much resistance that particular resistor is going to offer the circuit, the flow. So just those first three, you have Bayes, Volta, and Ohm, opening up worlds of possibility that were unknown before them. And they start to accumulate. The next one in 1831, Michael Faraday. And I would encourage anybody in this room who wants to really get an understanding of the, the brilliance of some of the people in the history of science, go to a biography of any size you want. I mean, go to Wikipedia, go to just, you know, your favorite search engine and look up Michael Faraday. The reason that Michael Faraday is so important in the history of science is he was, by some historians of science, the most brilliant scientist ever in the history of the world, from any country, at any time, even more than Einstein. He had many inventions, and what was interesting about him were actually two really fascinating things. Number one, he did not have a lot of formal education. So he didn't come out of a university and start working and work as a, as a fellow in some institute. Not a lot of, not a lot of uh, scholarship behind him. Yet he came up with all these interesting things. The other one was he was a devout Christian. Michael Faraday, probably in some people's minds, the most brilliant scientist that ever was, was a Christian. Now Michael Faraday came up with, among many, many other things, the theory of electromagnetic induction. Big word, let me give you a little bit of what that means. Magnetic, electromagnetic induction is, in one respect, what happens when you have one wire, let's say you have a wire, and it's connected to a battery, and it's creating a circuit. You put a resistor in there to keep it from shorting out. And you put another wire and a light bulb connected to that other wire, or something that would register that there's a voltage going through that second wire. The first wire, you've got a battery to charge it. The second wire, you've got nothing but a light bulb or a, a little meter or something. When you connect the battery, the, as the electricity goes through that first wire, it creates an electromagnetic flux. In other words, it's invisible. If you put a, a uh, if you were to put something like a compass next to it, the compass needle would move. But in addition to that, what happens is as that flux crosses this other wire, it induces a current in that second wire without a battery, without anything else. Just turning on the power on this wire close enough to this other wire, activates the second wire. That's electromagnetic induction in its simplest form. That too was absolutely an astonishing discovery back in the 1800s. Now, they, how they managed to make this work later on is an, an even more fascinating story, but one of the things that, if you were to look today at how electromagnetic induction is, is implemented, there's two places where you would find it all over the place. Number one, transformers. So electromagnetic induction in transformers works like this. You, you wrap a piece of, let's say, copper, or no, not copper, let's say iron, with a copper wire, and then you send pulses through it. Those pulses are gonna send this induction, this electromagnetic pulse out, and then another wire is gonna, gonna receive that. Now, if you have two of them, next to each other. Let's say the first one is wound exactly as the second one is wound. And then you sh instead you take the second one and you shrink it, let's say 50% the size of the first one. 
If you can get 100 volts through the first one, you can get 50 volts out of the second one. Why? It's shorter. The electromagnetic flux doesn't work. If one to one it does if they're both the same size, less than one to one if they're different sizes. The exact numbers are, are inductance, and I don't know the formulas on that. The point is I'm trying to get this to be very simple so that we understand that that kind of a transformer we use all the time. Those little, one little um, uh, circuit connected to another circuit that they're not touching. The only thing that's connecting them is this invisible flux from one to the other, and that's changing your voltage. If you look here, down below, this takes six volts, but it's connected to 110 volts. That little box has a transformer completely run by inductance. That's what that is. The other thing that we use that operates the same way, and think about what would it be like if he, did never, if he never discovered this, radios. How does that work? You set up a transformer way up in a mountain somewhere, or close by, whatever, and you send, that you send that pulse through that first circuit. It sends out this flux. Of course, the more powerful it is, the longer it goes, the further it goes. This energy transfers through the environment, and it strikes what? An antenna. An antenna is a wire. Okay, they're shaped in different ways. But that flux hits that wire, it goes down into the radio, and that's where you get a radio signal. So the, the transmitter is sending it all sorts of different frequencies, amplitudes, and the receiver is doing the same thing. You tune them, you get music, words, whatever. Super simplified. But without Faraday having discovered electromagnetic induction, you wouldn't have radios, you wouldn't have cell phones. Your cell phones operate exactly the same way. You wouldn't be able to change power. You, you could not have civilization today as we know it without Michael Faraday. That man was known to his peers as coming up with fantastic inventions. And all of these things that were occurring were occurring at a time in history when other things in culture, in art, and in politics were occurring at the same time. I'm going to do one more here, and then I'll move on. Christian Doppler, we've all heard of the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect, we learned probably in school, was when you hear a siren coming at you and it gets louder and louder, and the pitch rises. Then as it goes away, the pitch sinks. Or better than that, a train. The train comes at you, and as it, as it comes at you, it gets, the pitch gets higher and higher, and as it goes away, the pitch gets lower and lower. Why? Because as it's getting closer, the frequency rises. The, the, the time between the sound reaching us and the time bouncing off gets lower. I mean, it gets higher. It, it happens more and more frequently. And then it, it dissipates the other direction. Now, that's called the Doppler effect. But was Doppler worried about that? No, Doppler wasn't looking. He wasn't trying to figure out these kinds of things that have to do with auditory phenomena. He was actually looking at stars. So he was considering, what, why is it that when some stars look red and they seem to be traveling away from us, is that really what they're doing? Could that be what's going on there? So he was, he was trying to figure out I don't know, I, somebody, I, somehow I lost my sound. OK, my sound's back again. Um, the, the induction didn't work there. <laughs> so the, the, the bottom line for Doppler was he was trying to characterize the, the different wavelengths of light as electromagnetic radiation, and that if stars are moving away from us, they're going to be red, because that's a lower frequency. And if they're, excuse me, yeah, lower frequency. And if they're moving towards us, they're going to be blue because that's a higher frequency. So you've heard of red shifting? Red shifting means that's a Doppler effect of something moving away at the speed, at, you know, when we're talking about light. So that was what Christian Doppler was characterizing. Absolutely stunning at the time. And so think about this. These and many other discoveries were occurring at the same time. Look, 1842 is just, what, about uh, 15 years before um, Darwin publishes his, his Origin of the Species. So the history of 100 years before Darwin, you've got not only science starting to be able to characterize more and more physical phenomena without appealing to God. 
that's, that's probably the most important thing to remember here is that at this period of what was called the Enlightenment, more and more people were trying to look at the world without appealing to God. This occurred in politics. You see Marxism rising up at this time. You see communism rising up at this time. You see a lot of isms occurring. You see a lot of it occurring in philosophy. You see it even in the arts where they're shunning God as the source and trying to fill it in with man. And this is what's happening as Darwin hits. Darwin is the right man at the right time in scientific history to propose a theory that excludes God for explaining the entire diversity and existence of life on Earth. So the scientists at the time had a reason to say, let's pay attention to this guy. He was at the right time, exactly the right time. Now, what happens 100 years afterwards? Was what went on before him just a fluke? You know, the things happened and stuff went on about the way it went on. But no, actually it became more intensified because science has an interesting way of building on its successes. And it did it in the 100 years after Darwin as well. So what I'd like you to do now is think about it. Darwin strikes in 1859 publishes his paper at a time when science, politics, art are ready to dump God. The people who are most in tune with this are the scientists. So let's go after him. You have even more coming after him, more scientific discoveries that are literally world changing. These aren't just interesting discoveries. These are things that when they hit and they hit the world, the world changed. It was not the same again, never again. So the first one is Louis Pasteur. I mean, everybody's heard of pasteurized milk. Louis Pasteur was the one who figured out that there were such things as germs. He was the one who discovered germ theory. Now, if you didn't have germ theory, you would still have just millions and millions of people dying from diseases because they would have no understanding of the causes of the diseases. Now Pasteur wasn't, he didn't have it all figured out from the beginning, but the point was that he was the first one to say, you know what, the things that, are, that we can't see that are causing the things to get ripe or rotten or things to go bad are, are not spontaneously generating. In other words, the theory at the time was things just, life just arose spontaneously. And what Pasteur was saying is no, actually there are little microbes, they multiply, and those things cause diseases. So he figured if you were able to destroy them or control their growth, then you could keep people from getting sick or use the germs for the right purposes. So pasteurization and our ability to have things that last longer than you know, a, a day, we can thank Louis Pasteur for that. And not long after that, Dmitry Ivanovsky discovers viruses. He's looking, he says, all right, I get germ theory, but there's some things that are bigger than germs, I mean, smaller than germs, that are at play in this world. What are they? And he, he comes up with the term virus. And the, the virus he was able to determine existed by using porcelain and some other um, porous substances that germs couldn't get through, but the viruses could. So he creates virus theory. Imagine what the world would be like today if we did not know about viruses. At the time, that too was a stunning revelation. And then Einstein proposes special relativity. I don't have to get too far with that, but it's, it's interesting that if you have relativity and you start using relativity the way Einstein was conceiving it, it becomes easier and easier to push God out of the way. It starts to seem like you don't need a God to explain the existence of the universe or its operations. 1912, and this is interesting because uh, Hugh Ross has talked about Cepheid variables. Uh, Henrietta Swan Leavitt characterizes Cepheid variable stars. And a Cepheid variable star is a star that, that um, changes its luminosity. So it has a certain frequency that it pulses. And what she did was she characterized the the rate of pulse as compared to how luminous it was. 
And to us, it seems like, well, who cares? Well, it matters a lot to an astronomer. It helps us understand how far away things are, what the, what the stars are actually doing, and actually will take us into the next interesting discovery, which is in 1925, another woman, Cecilia Payne Kaposkin, discovers the composition of the sun and that hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. So have we heard Hugh talk about hydrogen being most abundant? That was discovered in almost 100 years ago by a woman who was looking at what was the sun made out of. And so she comes up with this fantastic theory and was able to characterize it. This again changes the world. The sun's not just a ball of fire anymore. The sun is something different. Sun is actually a, um, a really a cauldron of atomic activities that involves hydrogen. And so that creates a totally different theory of our universe, unlike never before. So afterwards, you get these constant, this, this constant increase in the number and quality of the discoveries that are going on. And as we see in the last century, so 1859 to 1959, and then after that, never in the history of the world have the discoveries come as fast and been as profound as they are in the past century. What does that mean if you're a scientist? Well, for, us, in, in most, for most of us, the scientific discoveries from the 40s onward, which is really our current period, become ubiquitous. That means they're everywhere. They become valuable. You can make money off of them, a lot of money, and become entertaining. So people want to have them in many respects. So you have the, the, really the three things that drive an economy, that you have ubiquity, everybody can have it, Valuable, something everybody thinks is useful, and entertaining, which is what everybody wants. So scientific discoveries become a very fundamental part of the psyche of people in our modern time. And because technology becomes widely known and associated with scientific discoveries, the scientific discoveries and technologies assume a very particular character. And technology drives the public belief that science that, that science is truth. Why? Because if science is what causes the technologies, we see that technologies are working, they must be true. Therefore, science is true. And the last part of this argument is that because evolution is science, it is therefore true. Do you see how the logic starts to flow from that? And so it becomes very easy to start to understand how it is that as time goes on, people start to realize or think that technology, science, evolution, all of them are true, therefore they're, they're credible. Now what? Now what? One of the explanations for why, particularly in the past 25, 30 years, that people are starting to see evolution as being more and more godless is that more in the, in the past 20, I think it's 20 or 25 years, the number of people with college degrees has doubled. So what do you get in college? You get educated by scientists. And what do the scientists believe? The scientists believe in a, in a universe that's unguided by God. Not all of them, of course. But if you get into, say, evolutionary theory, you realize that it becomes a paradigm. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So one of the consequences of this is that naturalism becomes the paradigm. Now, what do I talk about when I say naturalism? What, what does naturalism mean? Naturalism is the theory that all things that you can see in nature can be explained by other things in nature. That's a simplistic definition, but that's the definition I'm working from. So that if there's a physical phenomenon, that the only way to explain that physical phenomenon is by another physical explanation, another physical uh, phenomenon. That's naturalism, that all there is in nature is natural. And there's, there are no unnatural causes, or as we would say it, there are no supernatural causes. Now what does it mean that it becomes the paradigm? A paradigm 
the way I'm going to be using it is in the terms of the philosopher of science Thomas Kuhn. And he coined the phrase most famously in his books, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which he first wrote in 1963. Probably the most influential book in the philosophy of science in the past century. The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Utterly brilliant book by an utterly brilliant man. And if you only read it just because it's fun to read, read it. I've never read a more lucid writer than Thomas Kuhn. So what is Thomas Kuhn saying? Well, among other things, what he's saying is that there comes a time in the progress of science that a group of scientists, the whole world of scientists, will adopt a worldview in which all of the evidence that is viewed is considered. So for, let's, let's look at one paradigm, the Newtonian physics. All, right, all of the physics that led up to the point of Einstein, you know, that you can predict things, uh, the trajectories, speeds, velocities, masses, etc. Newtonian physics that we use all the time. So one of the terms that's used in Newtonian physics is mass, M-A-S-S. For us, mass might mean how much something weighs. It's really not what mass means, but that's the way most people think of it. Einstein comes along. His paradigm is completely different. His worldview is completely different. The term mass doesn't even mean the same thing. A Newtonian physicist talking with an Einsteinian physicist are now, as Kuhn put it, in two different worlds. The Einsteinian physicist is looking at mass as an alteration in the fabric of space-time. The Newtonian physicist doesn't even know what space-time is. Two completely different paradigms, two different ways of investigating the world. And by the way, what's evidence in one paradigm may not be evidence in the other. That's what I'm talking about in terms of naturalism becoming a paradigm. It becomes the lens through which all of biology is interpreted. It assumes that paradigmatic status. So evolution in biological sciences prevails because that's where it, that's where it lives. It's all about biological sciences. But other sciences, in other words, those who don't know anything about the biological sciences, adopt evolution as true because they expect that the evolutionary biologists know what they're talking about. After all, if I'm a physicist, I know what I'm talking about. I expect the evolutionary biologists to know what they're talking about. We're all talking about the physical world, aren't we? Yeah. So they adopt the same theories. The explanatory power increases. That is, what people believe the power of, of evolution to do, to explain the biological world, increases with two things. The first one is what's known as confirmation bias. A confirmation bias is the tendency to only look for the evidence that will prove your theory true. So I don't know if you've looked in the, the literature in, in evolutionary biology. I have, I'm not an expert in it, but I have looked in it a lot, and I've listened to a lot of people talk about it. And what you won't find in the evolutionary literature is a study or a large number of studies that are trying to disprove it. They're not looking for disconfirmatory evidence. They're looking for evidence to confirm evolution. Not to refute it, to confirm it. And it's kind of an interesting thing because you'd, you'd expect that in any science they would be at least pushing some kind of opportunities to refute it. But you won't find a lot of that in the evolutionary literature. It's confirmatory. So there's a confirmation bias in the way that evolutionists approach their science, partly because of the, the paradigm. The paradigm suggests that that's what you should be doing. You should not expect something else. And the other thing is bandwagon effects. Bandwagon effect is a social effect. <coughs> that is that I will go along with what other people in, that, that I consider my peers to do if, if not doing it is going to push me out. And that's, that's a bandwagon effect. The bandwagon effect is I, I believe what I believe, but I'm going to say what everybody else says because I want to be part of the group. It's more complicated than that, but that's what I'm going to be using simplistically as a bandwagon effect. So you have these two influences that make 
evolution theory appear more powerful because what are you getting? Well, you're getting things that appear to confirm it because they're not looking for anything else. And you're getting things that appear to confirm it because everybody's on the bandwagon to confirm it. Yes, sir. There are political influences, and, and I'm, well, I won't go too deeply into that. Uh, that's, its own, that's its own domain all by itself. But I can tell you that you're absolutely right, and there's not even any question that it's true. So people would say, well, no, science is absolutely without political influence. Baloney. Baloney. There are, there are scientific studies proving that that's false, that science is just as subject to political influences and sociological influences as anybody else is. And uh, I won't go any more than, further than that. I, I'd love to, but we'll, we'll leave it there. I, I want to get through this because I'm looking at my time, and uh, I need to get through a couple of more things. But thank you for that. Sorry, I just want to point out it was part of it. That's, that, that's okay. Thank you. So how do we approach this? So one of them, you can just adopt the theistic evolution. So that theistic evolution is that God is the one who installed evolution, and he's the one who guided it. And there's at least two different ways of looking at that. Now, now mind you, there are many ways of looking at theistic evolution. But the two ways that, that pop up most often, that one camp or the other, most of them are going to be in is, one of them is old earth. That you look at the evidence, the earth is billions of years old, the, the history of life appears to be billions of years old, and therefore, the theistic evolutionist is going to say, well, yeah, God operated from 3.8 billion years ago all the way through today, created all this variety. We're not sure how he did it, but he did it. That's one way of approaching it. The other one is the, what's called the young earth uh, theistic evolution, and that evolution occurred in just thousands of years. That's probably a little bit more difficult to swallow because the evidence is very strong against just thousands of years of, of life's existence, thousands of years of Earth's existence. But that is one of the theories you have to have in order to look at the, the two different approaches. The one thing that you have to really get from the young Earth version, though, is you have to appreciate that if you're going to adopt the young Earth version of theistic evolution, evolution is incredibly fast. I mean, if you adopt the young Earth version of of evolution, every creature that ever lived on the planet evolved from the few creatures that were on the ark. That spawned everything. Now, even the atheistic evolutionists won't buy that. They say that just that just doesn't, can't happen that fast. But the theistic evolutionists in the young Earth camp believe that, and that's so that's their version. And so that, there's two. Those two competing versions within and classes within them. So you could adopt theistic evolution if you wanted to, one of these two versions here and one of the substrates of them. Or you could just accept, accept atheistic evolution and say, well, you know, the evidence points to common descent, looks like a pretty good plan, um, there, all, all this evidence confirming it, and with all the people saying it's true, must be true, therefore we're going to buy it. Okay. That's another approach you could take. You could just concede it's atheistic evolution. Or you could propose a better explanation than the first two. The reason you have to have this third approach is because you can't just beat up on one or the other. In other words, merely attacking another person's position without giving a replacement for it isn't going to get you very far. Thomas Kuhn, by the way, made that point. He said, if you're in a paradigm, you're not likely to escape that paradigm unless a competitor comes along that has greater explanatory power and the adherents of the previous paradigm do one of two things. Either see the light and change or die. Because the old group will just die off. Now, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon with evolutionists, but if you can propose a better explanation than evolution, without having to wait for all the evolutions to die off, at least give them a reason to look. That's another alternative, and I think the best one. 
K U H N. Thomas Kuhn. And you will have no problem finding that book. And you'll have no problem seeing five star reviews everywhere you go. The ninth, there were several versions of it. He did one in 1963, another one in 1971, because he had critics between 63 and 71. Um, and then there were some versions after that, after he died. A lot of those just had people making commentary on it. I think if you get the 71 version, he has a, an, an appendix at the back called Answer to My Critics, which is, it's worth its price alone. So the 71 version is probably the best to get. I studied both of them when I was doing my philosophy of science work. And, and he's just an amazing guy. He, he is, by the way, part of the reason why um, social and cultural relativism adopted the position that there wasn't truth. As a matter of fact, some people, some postmodernists, looked to Kuhn to say that there is no such thing as truth because one of the things that Kuhn said was that because science progresses, there's no such thing as truth with a capital T. Yeah. So it's interesting that he ended up being co-opted by people who did not believe what he said and that took what he said differently and also tortured the term paradigm to mean any kind of theory. Not all theories are paradigms. So the better explanation, the, the biblical creation model. There are four critical failures of the evolution model, and we'll get into those. And we're going to look at the successes of the biblical creation model where the evolution model fails. And it's important to do both of these. Now I'm giving you four failures of the evolution model in my opinion, and in the opinion of others who've researched this, there are more. I'm, it's only because of time that I'm going in, in the shallow depth that I'm going. So the first one is the problem of the origin of life. Now the origin of life is an interesting problem because no one was there when it happened, and we can't go back and find the things that were there and do experiments on them. So we're in a we're in a particularly interesting problem here. The quandary is, what do you do with a one-off event? How do you analyze whether that one-off event, what the causes were, or whether there is only one cause? What does the evolutionist say? Well, the evolutionist says, somehow, in some way, the chemistry of the early Earth brought forth life. I have no clue how it happened. They admit that. They come up with all sorts of weird theories. They, pop, they postulate some really interesting sounding stuff. They have PhDs who say, well, you know, there could have been this particular environment, and then these chemicals could have done this, and those chemicals could have done that. The interesting thing about all of that is it's speculation, and that these claims that are made have this enormous theoretical and practical gaps in them. You just say, well, this converted to that and the, the cell wall formed. The cell wall formed? Do you know how complicated a cell wall is? Do you know what a cell wall even is? And once you get a cell wall, how are you gonna keep it? You know, for every kind of chemical reaction that you get, you gotta preserve it. So there's, there are just this enormous, enormous number of challenges to a purely organic chemical theory of life from non-life. I would recommend that if you want to go into a lot of detail about the best arguments against a chemical, organic creation of life from non-life, view the, the, the podcasts and the, the videos from James Tour. James Tour is a, a Christian, and he's also, in my opinion, one of the most brilliant scientists of our time. James T-O-U-R, like a, a Tour de France, T-O-U-R. Uh, James Tour unabashedly loves Jesus, and he says that. He'll start all his videos out with, I, I love Jesus. <laughs> and then he starts and starts cracking at, he'll take, um, he'll take some putative study that's, that says, okay, this is how we hypothesize the origin of life. And he'll just tear it up. Now, he's an organic chemist of the highest order. Hundreds of peer-reviewed journal articles, scores of patents. 
He does in incredible work. He knows his business. There is nobody who has argued the science with him because he knows his stuff. So I would talk, I would have you talk, uh, I would refer you to James Tour for expert guidance on the problem of organic chemistry developing life. There's another problem with organic or with life or originating all by itself, and that life has one particularly important feature to it that nowhere else in nature that's not life has. That it has a very, very particular form of specified information in it that and that information leads to something else. In other words, that specified complexity, for example, in the DNA, how do you get that? How do you get the information in that DNA in the first place? How do you arrange everything? And what are you going to use to translate that to do something with it? So that you won't find DNA just happening in an unnatural world. No matter how you look at it, the things that are in the cell come from living things, come from other living things. And the information that we're talking about, the specified information that's coded, coded information, not Shannon information, but coded information, doesn't occur anywhere in nature, and the only place we see it is somebody designs it. So if you were to see uh, out in the desert, out in the middle of nowhere, uh, a piece of concrete and etched in it were some words, would you think, hmm, wow, the wind made that interesting set of words on that piece of concrete? Or would you think a human being did it? Of course you'd say a person did it. And so the, the notion is that there's nowhere in nature or in the natural world outside of living things where you will see any kind of coded information that doesn't have a mind that created the code. Nowhere. That's a, that's a really interesting argument for why, as we look at this, we have to ask ourselves, if that is the case, are we using a God of the gaps argument to say that God did this? No. All we have to do is appeal to what, hap what we see right now in the real world, use the same mode, same scientific mode to evaluate that as, and, and, and apply that to the origin of life. We come to the same conclusion. So let me go back here um, on, the, on the origin of life. The one question that gets asked is, um, if it isn't a God of the gaps argument, then why would you even bother putting God in there? Well, because he's the best explanation. And we'll go into that after I get through these, these few more critical failures, why it is that we, just one piece of evidence, one way of looking at it, of why it is that God is a reasonable alternative to just accidental naturalistic explanations. So origin of life is the first problem. And you'll notice that the biggest problems for evolution are all origin problems. There are more origins than this. There's origin of consciousness, there's origin of mind. So I'm just getting through to, to a few of them, but one of them is the origin of the, what's called the Avalon or Ediacaran fauna. Um, these were fossils that were discovered down in Australia. Um, Avalon and Ediacara are areas down by Australia where they found these fossils. And what, what we find is that, or what the researchers found was that about, uh, let me get my numbers right here, the, the, around 635 to 538 million years ago, you have showing up whole cloth, completely de novo, these creatures that had never come before. So before that period of time, what you have is bacteria, you have blue-green algae, and you've got no animals. And then all of a sudden, boom, in the fossil record, you've got these incredibly interesting creatures. They're animals that, that have, um, some of them look like uh, hollow tubes with tentacles sticking out of them. Others look like, like plant leaves sticking up from the bottom of the ocean. And these are animals and other animals that have different body plans, all occurring at the same time. 
and they, you can see them spread out in different areas, but they never change. There's, a, there's a, this, this stasis. They just stay the way they are. So they come, come on suddenly. They stay the way they are, and then there's no change. So how do you go from having blue-green algae and bacteria to these incredibly complicated creatures? How? How? So the, if you were to adopt evolution, you'd have to say, well, there were creatures that came before it and that they steadily moved and became what these are. The unfortunate thing is that there's no evidence of that, zero. So the, the evolutionist has to explain that. The Christian has to explain it too. So the creation theory gets to explain the same problem, but we will. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to read some, a quote to you from one of the researchers who actually made the discovery of the, uh, the Avalon fauna. And he said, these Ediacara organisms do not have an ancestor-descendant relationship with the Cambrian animals. And most of them went extinct before the Cambrian explosion. And this group of organisms, most species, seem to be distinct from the Cambrian animals. In other words, what he's saying is what is going to happen next is another one of these sh stunning origins, which is called the Cambrian explosion, in which all of the body plans that will ever exist on the planet arose. So you have the, this Avalon explosion, blue-green algae, now all of a sudden animals. Then these die off, most of them die off. And then nothing, and then boom, multiple phyla. The very close to the top order of all the creatures that have ever lived and that ever will live were there. Whole cloth. Nothing between them and the Avalon groups. No evolutionary images at all. So you look and what are you looking at if you're an evolutionist saying, oh, this is going to be a tough one. We expected to see fossils all the way through. Maybe some more than others. Zero. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. This is a very, very difficult problem. I call it a failure because it's a failure of evolution. Evolution would predict a lot of really great fossils. It would never predict what we see here. It's absolutely counter to the theory of evolution. And also all ecosystems come at once. Absolutely. I mean, that's a really good point. The, the point was that you don't just have creatures showing up. They show up in colonies. They show up in ecosystems that work with each other, you know, it's, just, it's staggering. And most people don't even realize how staggering that really is. If you appreciate it, you appreciate how the Lord works. He does things very quickly. <laughs> and he does things in ways that make, make you realize he is the one that did it. Same thing with humans. You have humans that show up. Now you look at what the evolutionists say, well, we're descendants from some primates that came before us. The only problem with that is none of the other primates share the most important features that make humans human. And that, for example, would be our ability to plan long in the future. No chimpanzee can do it. No monkey can do it. None of the other creatures can plan long in the future. And the, what some of the evolutionists say, well, they plan, you know, they, 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 get, they do seasonal activities. No, there's this, an explanation for that and it's called associative learning. And what associative learning does is um, an animal can look at one thing and associate it with something else and associate it with something else and associate it and see these associations and link them. That's much, much different than anticipating something 500 years from now where there is no associative learning capable. So animals, whatever kind of animals you want to look at, chimpanzees, orangutans, nothing, nothing in the animal kingdom can do what the humans can do. Humans are exceptional. They show up suddenly. You can look at the, uh, let's say, the Neanderthals and say, well, maybe they were human. The problem with that is we don't know how they behaved. And there's some significant differences in their skulls and their body plans that make it look like they have no connection to us at all. Are there some genetic markers that are similar or connected? Possibly so. But that doesn't mean that they're human. So the point is that humans and the origin of humanity is a sudden event. You look at the history of, 
of life, and you look at particularly the past couple hundred thousand years, and when humans show up, there is no time in the history of life where events occur and the behavior of the animals is anything like what we do. We are a unique group, and we can do things that no other animal can. So how does, how does evolution explain human uniqueness, human exceptionalism? It cannot, but can creation theory do that? Well, first of all, Genesis 1 predicts what we see. So the creation theorist is saying we are looking at the Bible as our justification for accepting the, the, the belief that God was the one that created all this. So if you look at the origin of life, there's no known precursors. In other words, there's nothing that seems to have led up to life. It just, went, it just came on. Um, should we expect that? when you read what Genesis 1 says. Absolutely. That's exactly what you would expect. If you were to look, read the Genesis account that God created life, and it looks like he created life whole cloth and just instantly, each day by day different, different creatures, nothing precursor, nothing before it. The origin of the Avalon creatures, each one was made after their own kind. In other words, you don't have them gently coming from other ones. There, you have a set of particular kinds of creatures, each one made after their own kind with no change in them. So God creates after all the animals after their own kind. What the kind means, we really aren't sure. Species, probably not, because we know that, that animals can, can evolve within species, whether one kind of an animal species can become another, Maybe, depends, there's like 20 different definitions of species. But who cares, even if they do, that doesn't prove anything. All that proves is that one species can become another species. But what it doesn't prove, even if it does prove that you could get species definitions or, or changes, is that above that taxa, if you go up into the family or you go up into the orders or the, the very the phyla, absolutely inviolable. They're there and they're created whole cloth, completely as they are today. Made after their own kind, each one. The same thing with the creatures in the Cambrian explosion. They show up, they show up with their body plans, each one after their own kind. Do they vary in their own kind? Of course they do. Are there different kinds of dogs? Of course there are. The same with all the rest of the animals. And then the origin of, of humans, the, the claim here is that they are made as they are, with no precursors. There's no evidence that any other animal, any other of the bipedal primates, behaved with the mind and the, the activities that we use as an explanation for what God is, what the Bible says, we were made in God's image. When we are made in God's image, we have certain features that God has that no animal has. We relate to God verbally. We relate to God in love. We relate to each other verbally. We relate to each other in love. We plan. We sacrifice. We don't sacrifice for the species. We sacrifice because we do it out of love or out of some kind of ethical propriety that no other animal has. So the image of God in humanity is what we look at as a biblical expectation for what we should see separating us from every other animal. And that is exactly what we see. In other words, the predictions from Genesis are what we see in the physical world. So that becomes evidence for our position as creation theorists to evolution. So as we wrap this up, how should we approach evolution? Well, at least talk about the failures of evolution. And there are very, very powerful failures. The four that I talked about and many others. And then offer the creation model as an alternative because the alternative actually gives some really good evidence for why we should believe the Bible and the Bible's accounts. It explains what the physical world shows us. And then finally, there isn't any purpose in doing any of this if there isn't a gospel. If there were no God and there were no Jesus, why bother with this? 
you won't always get a chance to present the gospel to somebody who you're talking with about evolution. And if you're trying to persuade somebody that the world was made by God, then why? Then why? Everyone deserves the opportunity to hear the gospel, and certainly when we're talking about evolution, we won't always have that opportunity. But somewhere along the road, we need to have in the back of our mind that when the opportunity arises, we should be able to say face to face to someone we're talking to about this, that Jesus Christ walked the earth, claimed to be God, proved it by doing miracles, dying on the cross, paying for the sins of the world, rising from the dead and proving that he was God, and then telling us that if we want to not have to be separated from God from eternity, we follow him forever. That's the gospel, get that to people. That's the whole purpose of apologetics. And all of the rest of this is interesting, but all of it is worthless if ultimately that isn't our goal. Our goal should ultimately to be to present the gospel. So with that, I'll open it to questions. We've got a little bit of time, about 10 or 15 minutes. Yes, sir. The, the failure to, the, the question, well, I'll just answer, ask, answer the question, ask the question. The question was, what are the four failures I was referring to? The four that I was talking about were the, the failure to answer the question, how did life originate chemically? Okay, that's a failure for evolution. They can't explain that. How did life originate, or excuse me, how did the Avalon fauna arise suddenly with no precursors? That's a failure. A failure to explain. How did life originate in the Cambrian explosion with no precursors? Another failure of evolution to predict that. And then the, the existence of humanity and its uniqueness and difference from all the other creatures. There is nothing in evolution that, that would predict that humans would have the characteristics they have today that are so different from any other animal, any other primate. Thank you. Um, I couldn't help but think when you were discussing Faraday as a believer, oh, that as a believer, um, that there has to be some kind of intersection of be your belief helping, God helping you in um, inventing things certainly inventing things in science, um, you can't see a magnetic field. So you can't see God, but there's a belief there. Yes. And is, is your question, before you give, it, give the mic away, is your question, um, does being a Christian and a scientist, um, do those work together? Is that what you're saying or asking? Yes, and I knew I was going to have trouble asking the okay. question, but yes, that's that's... That's what I'm saying, that you're, you're believing in something you can't see. And so um, in order to go forward and um, invent various <coughs> theorems or what have you, you can't see what you're learning and what you're inventing either. So that there's got to be some interface there. It's just my, my thoughts as you were talking about. Yeah, Friday. thank you. You know, the, the great thing about the the Christians in history who have invented things is that they prove one very interesting and important point about science is that if you're a Christian, science is a godsend. Because when you are doing science, you are looking at the nature that God has made. And you're looking at the wonders that God has given us. And you're, as it were, getting a, an inkling into the mind of God. Some of the greatest Christians who were scientists actually said that. You peer into the mind of God when you do science. That's a wonderful thing. Scientists get a chance to see things the rest of us don't ever get to see. They make discoveries about God that we won't ever know. And if you think about it, in Romans 1, uh, chapter, ch chapter 1, and verse 19, 20, where we're held accountable to know the existence of God, how are we held accountable to know the existence of God and His eternal nature? By looking at nature. It says, we are held accountable by looking at the glory of the creation to know, number one, God exists, and number two, his character. So the scientist is doing that. Science is, in some respects, nothing more 
than an amplified sense of applying our five senses to the outside world. It's taking our senses and magnifying them with telescopes, microscopes, instruments, and other devices. So science is tailor-made for the Christian. Thank you. What else? Yes, sir. Can you restate the name of the book, of Kuntz's book? Yes, Thomas Kuhn's book, the title of that is The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Thank you. Mark, we have one comment. Yes. Uh, you cannot publish a paper in the biological sciences without paying homage to evolution in some way. And uh, uh, the person that did this, said, I did a survey of studies and could not find one in the secular journals. Did you want to comment back on that? Or? That's interesting. Yeah, th there are, it's hard to find journals on, I mean, there are journals about evolutionary biology. <laughs> you know, that, that's just, they're just all, that's all they talk about. Then there are other, other journals that talk about biological sciences and will refer back to evolution as being a putative explanation for what they found, or that what they found is a putative confirmatory evidence of evolution. But what's also interesting is that there are some biological sciences that don't talk about evolution at all, because they don't need to. You can do biology quite nicely without ever talking about evolution at all. Make your discovery. Get on with it. You don't have to talk about evolution. You weren't there, just how do the animals work today? Okay, that's all you need. So you really don't even need to talk about evolution to do biology. They happen to do it because it's part of the bandwagon. It is, as one of our friends talked about, part of a political regime as well. I won't go any further than that, but thank you for that comment. He's absolutely, or she's absolutely right. It's very difficult to find any kind of discussions on, evo on biological systems without some reference to evolution. It, it has become, as I talked about earlier, naturalism has not become the, the paradigm. Yes, sir. If it doesn't work, just say it loud and I'll repeat it. Okay. And back to the routine here. <laughs> Using the microphone. Um, it's, it really seems like uh, the things that you, you were talking about um, were discoveries or are things that were developed uh, to, to, to explore these discoveries. But uh, with evolution, it's more like a explanation or a theory or, 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 or a conjecture to me. I think that's a distinction. What do you think about that? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting distinction. And you're, you're right. What is called the theory of evolution what I described as the theory of common descent, you know, back to the last universal common ancestor, isn't the same thing as discovering the, uh, the inductive properties of electrical circuits. Because the, elect inductical, the, 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 the properties of electrical circuits, the discovery of hydrogen, all those kinds of things, you can repeat them. You can keep on going back to it. They're not theories. They're actually demonstrable. And they produce technologies that prove them. The, the problem with evolution is, it doesn't make any good predictions. You know, the, matter of fact, the kind of predictions you would expect from evolution constantly fail. And what you, the only thing you can do with that kind of historical theory is to make what are called retrodictions. And that is you go back into history and say, all right, if we apply the theory to events that we see in the past, does it work? The answer is no, it really doesn't work. Now, the reason that it's worked to some degree is that if you if you take very large scale diagrams, it does appear to work. So if you just cherry pick the fossils, you can make them look like they progressed and in a linear fashion. But if you actually look at them on a, the so-called tree of life, it's not, it is not at all a tree of life. The connectors are entirely hypothetical. They're not real. And that's where the, that's where the that retrospective or retrodiction fails for evolutionists. 
it should account for those, and it does not. So you're right. The scientific stuff that we were talking about in those 200-year periods, entirely factual. Evolution, entirely speculative. And Darwin even said that. Now, I don't want to beat up on Darwin because Darwin is not the only kind of evolution. But Darwin said, you know, my, my, my theory is a speculation. Interesting. Thank you. What else? Anybody else? Yes, sir. I believe it was also stated by Darwin. I believe Hughes also uh, pointed out, and probably even you, that Darwin in his first edition referred to God, and it was only in later edition that he took God out of the equation. I, I think that may be true. Uh, you know, I have not read everything Darwin has written, but what I've written that Darwin, excuse me, what I've read that Darwin has written suggests to me that he was probably not a theist. He was raised a theist, but I think as you read his writings, it, it looks like he wants to use the term creator as a force, not as a god. So he, he knew what the theology was. I don't think he bought it. But others disagree. Yeah, now I now think about it, it was Steve Huffy that made that point. OK, yeah. thank you. And I'm, I want to make sure we understand that there are different forms of, of evolution. I only talked about this broad form. There's, there's a Darwinian evolution. And I talked about the extended evolutionary synthesis, uh, neo-Darwinism. There are other versions of it out there. So don't just beat up on Darwin. There's a, there's a, that would be a, a, a straw man argument, just beating up Darwin and saying he didn't know things. Pardon me? What other version? The, the extended evolutionary synthesis and neo-Darwinism, which neo-Darwinism says that um, what, what Darwin didn't know about genetic theory and about um, DNA, he had no clue about any of that kind of stuff. So he thought it occurred in a different way. And we are out of time. So I want to say thank you to everybody. I appreciate you being here. And um, Hugh should be back next week. And if he isn't, somebody even better will be here to, hands, to answer for it better than me than, than anyone else. So with that, thank you all very much. And have a nice rest of the week. <laughs>